Our next presenter is Dr. Nalini Nagy from the University of Maryland. Good morning. I guess you can say that I've had an unusual childhood. I grew up in seven different countries across four different continents. And uh, I was born in Japan, actually, to Indian parents and nicknamed Junko after the great Junko Tabai, who was the first woman to climb Mount Everest. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't much of a climber, like my namesake. Still not much of a climber. In fact, very unathletic. Um, yes. But my privileged upbringing did really open my eyes at a very early age to the fact that, you know, even though the world is constructed and marked by borders, people live their lives in a way that transcend these borders. And that there's so many people whose lives are truly transnational, right? And for the 43 million immigrants in the United States, immigrants like myself, these transnational connections are really what sustain us, are really what sustain our well-being. But what happens when there are policies that ignore such realities? When there are policies that privilege some but mark so many others with marginalizations? Over the last decade, my work has focused on the behavioral health of Latino immigrant day laborers. I've conducted hundreds of interviews with men, men like Jorge, who come to the United States, often alone, to support their family, to work in construction or demolition, uh, work in an unregulated market uh, that is often consists of dangerous and difficult jobs rife with workers' rights abuses. And throughout these difficult times, my research has found that the most significant factor that helps these men sustain their well-being is their connection, their connection with their family. As Jorge shared with me, every cent that I earn, I battle it for them. Whatever comes my way, I endure. Men like Jorge have many struggles as undocumented workers. Often they're perceived to be outside of the protection of the law and labor standards. They often stand in public street corners or at Home Depot for days, weeks sometimes, looking for employment. And as they stand outside exposed to the harsh climatic conditions, they're often exposed to security guards who may harass them. They may be exposed to suspicious stares by their community members or neighbors who may look at them as vagrants. They may even get tickets for loitering. And when a job comes by, they're often exposed to really unsafe conditions where they may not be given safety equipment, safety training. They may not even be given a bathroom break, right? And when they complete this job, they may often encounter a situation where an employer may say, I don't want to pay you. And in fact, one out of five day laborers every month experiences this. These employers taking advantage of the fact that these men, undocumented men, have a fear of authorities, have a deportation fear that gives them this sort of vulnerability. Or they may get paid and may get dropped off at an unknown location, carrying the cash of their earnings, and then they may be targeted for victimization and robbery as they're perceived as walking ATMs. This is a term coined by a national reporter really speaking to the prevalence of crimes against immigrants and this perception that immigrants carry large amounts of cash, yet they're afraid to report crime to the police, making them easy targets. They know that one is undocumented. They know that a person, after the whole day sweating, may be doing roofing under the sun, the whole day working so that one Friday, one guy may take your money, the money that cost you so much to earn, with the sweat of your labor that you have earned 
maybe enduring hunger and by going to the corner to look for work with the hope in God that you will find work. There is sadness in these words, right? Being robbed of wages or not being able to earn enough is deep and painful. And my research finds that the sadness or desesperación is not necessarily in reference to the workers' rights abuses that these men encounter in their daily experiences, or it's not necessarily in reference to the lack of protection that our immigration system engenders, or it's not necessarily in reference to the fact that their own neighbors and community members have a racialized suspicion of them. But really, for Jorge and many men like him, it's about the fact that earning money is a process of supporting family. It's a process of maintaining connection despite the distance, despite the borders, maintaining that transnational connection. And when an employer refuses to pay Jorge, just as, like I mentioned earlier, one out of five day laborers experience every month, or when he's robbed, or when he's unable to send money, there is a deep shame and sorrow. There's a fear in these moments that the thread of transnational connection may become, or may be in danger of becoming frayed. Sometimes I don't want to call home. I don't have money, and I know that they're going to need things for school. Sometimes I feel afraid to say I have no money. And that is what is emblematic of this battle to fight what I argue is a state-sanctioned process of disconnection. What, in many of my interviews with day laborers have referred to, can lead to a deep despair that settles in the body. Worried to tell your children that you don't have enough money, not wanting to burden your wife with problems, she has so much on her plate already, can lead to not calling this week or the next or the next. Over time, over years, over decades, it becomes a battle to maintain this thread of transnational connection as the state systematically disconnects you from being able to work under safe and regulated conditions, as the state systematically disconnects you from the protection of authorities or even systematically disconnects you from medical care and social services. While a majority actually will continue to maintain a connection like Jorge does, talking to his family every two days with specially long conversations on Fridays, there are some that all of this is gonna take a toll on, right? And this toll will then feature in the fact that this transnational connection will then remain only a semblance of a memory. And they will remain with this hope to see maybe one day their children. Children who are no longer children. Children whose faces, a day laborer who's homeless in Baltimore stated to me, whose faces he sees in his dreams. Yet, Today, in the United States, we're continuing to discuss policies that will disconnect. Policies that are discussing separating children from parents seeking asylum. Policies that are placing DACA and TPS recipients in limbo. Policies that are continuing a system that maintains an underclass of undocumented people that are disconnected from a social safety net. And a wall, a wall that physically separates and criminalizes men like Jorge who seek a better life, not only for themselves, but for their families. As we continue to live in an increasingly transnational world, I really want you to reflect and think about connection. I want you to reflect and think about how policies connect you, how your families connect you. And then I want you to think about, and remember actually, we still, we continue to live in a world where a Japanese woman climbed the highest peak in Nepal, 
we continue to live in a world where a child born to Indian parents named after this same Japanese woman is standing here talking to you and whose dreams and aspirations have been privileged. But still, as we're thinking about that, I want you to also remember that we continue to live in a world where the dreams and hopes and aspirations of Jorge, boosted by his transnational connections, are marginalized. And how he has to battle each and every day through layers of state-sanctioned policies that hack away at his connections. We, as social workers, must join this battle and stand with Jorge and millions like him and demand the discontinuation of these policies that privilege some and marginalize the dreams and lives of so many others. This is not the time to sit, afraid to climb. This is really a time to reach for a change. Thank you.